How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. It's Friday. It's Friday. Yeah. Yeah. Been a good week, though. Got a bunch of good stuff done. Yeah. I'm uh, working through a site copy for the new marketing site. Nice. You guys doing anything this weekend? Uh, my wife's got friends coming in town, so they're, they're staying here. Nice. Doing the Nashville thing, you know, I'm sure. At least one night contributing. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that'll be fun. They haven't um, got to hang out a long time. High school friends, so. Fun. Yeah. We, uh, we have a quiet weekend at home. Oh, really. Nice. I always feel like it's it's surprising how many weekend planes like stack up. You're just like, why do I feel like I'm never just hanging at home? My husband's have something old boss used to call me his social planner. <laughs> <laughs> what's your wife's uh, plan for this weekend he's like i don't know yet <laughs> yeah i just go around to i don't know if you guys got a super bad storm yesterday not yesterday but the last few days I feel like we've gotten a lot of rain i was like all excited to go put the stuff in a coffee shop or something get a bunch of writing hammered out and then the thunderstorm started at like nine. oh yeah the dogs weren't having oh. it at all <laughs> They're like, we'd like to get out yeah. of here, crawl inside your skin, or whatever makes that sound stop. It's been so humid here, but I think this weekend's supposed to be finally like a break and the humidity heat. We'll see. I guess. We got off on like Saturday last week, and it was 98% humidity. Yeah. Yeah, the two points have just been disgusting. I feel like at that point, you're just swimming through, swimming through the air. Yeah. Yeah. So I learned that, um, like the re- there's like relative humidity. The tangent for a second. Oh, let me let me geek out. So that's like, um, I think that's just a measure of the moisture in the air that can that's- feel different depending on the dew point. So the dew point is obviously like the temperature at which dew will form in the grass. Yeah. And so the higher the dew point is like really what we feel the humidity because you can have 100 percent relative humidity if it's like snowing or something yeah like it's obviously doesn't feel humid but if the dew point's really high like 70s is like real pretty high where it just feels disgusting yeah we've had it i mean i've looked outside on my little weather meter and it's been like almost 80 like 79 degree dew point it's just that's when it's like at its worst it's been like that all week i mean it was raining yesterday and that said the humidity was like 95 percent i was like it looks like 100 to me that, that, that is fully human. That is literal <laughs> water. Yeah. I'm sure I have some part of that wrong, but uh, I've at least noticed that like tracking the dew point is a better indicator of like, how it feels than sometimes the relative humidity. Because I was just to be confused about that. It's like, well, it doesn't feel as bad as other times, but it says it's like 90 something percent, you know. So speaking of water. Uh, Tyler, you're joining me today to talk about the first transatlantic telegraph cable. The first time we could communicate across the ocean without your message going on a ship. So super cool story. Um, yeah, I'm excited to dig in. Like this is some really cool stuff here. I was I thought that it would be kind of just like, oh yeah, they did it, and that, yeah, like the more I dug into it, I was like, and there's some really cool tidbits of info in here. So on August 5th, 1858, the very first transatlantic telegraph cable was completed, linking North America with the UK. Uh, It was the fifth attempt from a man named Cyrus West Field and involved the joint effort of four ships, all of which have great names, the Agamemnon, the Valorous, the Niagara, and my personal favorite, the Gorgon. The four ships met in the middle of the ocean, which I love. They were like, we're just going to meet up in the middle. And two of us are headed for Trinity Bay, Newfoundland. And two of us are headed for Valencia, Ireland. Um, Seems really simple when you think about it, but clearly it was the fifth try. So it wasn't quite as easy as it's sounding. Uh, So by August 5th, the cable had been successfully laid and sat on the ocean floor at depths up to two miles below the sea surface. On August 16th, President James Buchanan and Queen Victoria uh, exchanged pleasantries across the sea for the first time. 20 years after the telegraph was invented, there were a couple different people who invented it at the same time. The one we're probably more familiar with is Samuel Samuel Morse, who is famous for the Morse Code. 
Within 10 years of the telegraph being invented, there were over 20,000 miles of cable crisscrossing the U.S. Um, that rapid communication made it possible for American expansion, made the railroad safer to travel because you could communicate things quicker. Uh, it was a huge boost to business conducted across the growing expanse of the U.S. Unfortunately for our buddy Cyrus, he accomplished what he set out to do, but the cable was pretty weak and within a month, it no longer was reliable for inventing any sort of information. So they kind of abandoned the project. And then it would be another eight years before they figured out how to do it correctly. Um, which seems you like- You might say he laid the groundwork for that. Oh, God. He might, he might yes. say that. How many dad jokes are you gonna get in here? <laughs> I love it. We'll see. Did, we'll see. He Time did lay the out. groundwork for that. Obviously, it wasn't going to be something that was easy to accomplish with this being his fifth time trying to do it. Um, but in the end, the fact that he did get it done meant that everyone knew it was possible. It was just like, how do we do this in a way that's more sustainable? Um, I'm sure at that time, you have like a really limited knowledge of what's happening to cables on the sea floor. But like, look at the lasting impact it's had. Like that one, that one guy trying to decide like, yeah, we, we can and we should try and do this. It's, you know, how many times a day do we talk to people who don't live in this country? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Like what I found, you know, reading up on this story was like, there was good collaboration between the government of the United States and then in the, of Great Britain at the time too, which was really interesting both supplied ships and even subsidies yeah. from the government. Like we passed, uh, I think a bill to help support this effort, um, like signed by the president, which was really interesting that, you know, to have like such an undertaking, have two international you know, entities like work together on that, I thought was pretty cool. Just some really interesting factors that played into the fact that it took so many attempts. I read that, um, the, two they had to hire two firms to build this cable because they had four months to do it and out of the out of great britain and they ended up twist like twisting the wire in different directions like one firm did it this way another firm did it another way so they couldn't even splice the two like lengths together correctly they had to like come up with a a, a way to do that uh because otherwise the one side would untangle as yeah. the tension pull would would you know increase on it over time so just, like there's little things like that i read about how differences in like copper quality were found by some of the like one of the in electrical engineers that was overseeing this project um but at that time it was sort of like well we're already making with what we have like it's really interesting how you think about we have standards for these things like regulations for quality material control that just didn't necessarily exist at that time and you see that play out over, hey, we have to take us five times because our cable keeps breaking. And um, it's interesting because that can be frustrating today you know, for maybe manufacturers, people starting new new businesses, new ideas. But um, that's sort of the flip side of it, you know, when that stuff isn't there. So they needed a project manager that could work quickly across the ocean and didn't have to. Yeah. Yeah. Someone specialized in Six Sigma. They need to get their own JIRA board. Yeah. Yeah, where's that trailer board at? <laughs> I think it's also interesting to think that, like, once it was completed, or, you know, like, I'm sure that after it was originally laid, even though it didn't work for very long, it probably spurred a lot of people to start thinking about, like, how can we work quicker and easier with, with people in other countries that we can't reach right now? I feel like today we really take globalization for granted because it's just kind of like always been part of our lexicon. It's always been part of like, we've been buying products made in China since how long, you know, like that's always been part of our lives. Yeah. Um, it would have been cool to see like what kind of opportunities that opened up for people and kind of like what, what that first taste of globalization was like. So apparently they, there were like parades, there's a parade, New York did a whole thing when they first had the message come through from like Queen Victoria, um, 
like it was a big a big deal he said made it to be like a big deal yeah i wish it was and i think there was even a quote from from president buchanan at the time with where he said in his message back something to the effect of like that this was more important than any war like any previous war um for like for the for the globe in terms of just the ability to communicate and to spread ideas and yeah uh different things which was just interesting that like people understood i think at the time too the importance of that and like how game-changing that was to go from i think the phrase that that they were using was like two weeks to two days yeah uh in terms of communication time yeah so it's pretty cool two days is that how long it took to still send the message i think there was still like yeah processing time like to to capture and then like basically print the received yeah like, messages and and then like they're i think they used to do a thing where they would confirm the message back you'd have to, so you'd have to send it back to make sure you got the right thing i don't know so i'm sure somebody knows exactly how that process worked but yeah that was like their phrase that i think was in two weeks to two days um marketing already marketing they're already like we're taking it around the world yeah, even, you know, like it takes minimum two weeks, I'm sure, to sail across the ocean. I've never tried that either. And dangerous, obviously. Yeah. Storms, <sighs> all sorts of stuff. That's all. I think that's something that's pretty crazy to think about, too, is like the, the weather in uh, the weather in the North Atlantic is not great. Like that's where the Titanic sank. Yeah. I, I think two of the ships almost crashed. Yeah. Or crashed. Um, tipped over though because of all the weight of the cable that they were carrying like i forget on one of the attempts though they hit some pretty bad storms and because they're so top heavy almost yeah uh capsized yeah which is just crazy um and you would think after like four attempts at doing it in the same location they'd be like maybe we'll try somewhere new <laughs> they did it again that feels like a project management oversight they're like guys we need to rethink this <laughs> Well, this, so they were competing. Like the interesting thing about this that we, I feel like the parallels are so not surprising to just how the world works today. Is there were there were competing ideas on the board on like the electrical engineering aspect of it, right? So how do we send it? How is it constructed? How are we capturing and receiving the messages? And so there were like different ideas on how to do that. Um, that I think caused some of these issues on, hey, this is the right way to do it. No, it's not. One of the one of the lead um, electrical engineers for, I think the first first while, was not a trained like electrical engineer. He was a medical doctor that got really interested in this, and then said like, I'm going to learn everything through like practical experimentation, which is cool. Yeah, but obviously it might create some gaps, right? And and I think there was just conflict between him and someone else about like the best way to do it. And um, I think part of the reason that first one broke is they tried to send so much voltage through through the wire that like the insulation broke down. Um, and so it's just really interesting to see how you can get derailed even by little things like that on such a massive project, right? Yeah. And it's a new groundbreaking technology or like a groundbreaking endeavor just little things like that you know people's opinions have big impact on top of that you're working with uh i mean you're working with people you're working with a group that's in the uk you're working with a group that's in the united states how are they communicating yeah how are they communicating about what they're trying to get done when they can't they're still on the two-week timeline I mean, if they couldn't yeah. even get the cables right at, at two factories right next to each other, maybe there was little hope for this first couple. Yeah. And the interesting thing, too, about that was apparently there was significant opposition, at least in the U.S., to establishing this with Great Britain at the time. Like There were um, congressmen who were very like protective and were like, no, we don't we don't want to have that type of like open network if you will or dialogue with great britain it's just an interesting interesting time still uh but it was you know 18 1858 like, I think we it was. just got uh, rid of those people 
I mean, it's like a generation <laughs> away, basically, right? Yeah. So it's, it's just a different mindset, which is that we have today. I think it's still a common situation where advances are made and there is always going to be a group of people who's resistant to that change, even if yeah. another, another group, a larger group of people can see how it's going to further everything, technology, research, yeah. commerce, uh, resources. Yeah whatever it may be there's there's always going to be a group of people that's like i don't think we should let's not rock the boat literally and metaphorically here <laughs> that's mine there's my dad joke <laughs> well done well done <laughs> um, but in the end like look at look at all of the good that came out of that yeah i, I think it'd be really interesting to like um to know what the research process was between that cable being laid and what eventually became the successful iteration of it. I, like, I think it speaks, it's a foreshadow of like how fast technology can advance. If I remember correctly, they went from like point, like the initial line, I think transferred like 0.1 words per minute. Um, whereas the one about eight or eight to 10 years later was eight words per minute. So it's 80 times faster in like less than a decade. Right. Yeah. Um, just that exponential curve of, like you said, sort of R and D understanding how the first one went wrong, where it yeah. could be better. And I love that that like, we live in a country where that's that type of like innovation is acceptable and, and easy. And, I mean, not easy, but it's attainable. Um, and we, have the ability to innovate like that on other ideas you know i think that's and you still see it today where it's you know like there's um obviously ai is like all the rage now it's like all this new thing but there are companies that have been working on it for decades so it's like a real slow ramp and then all of a sudden it's like the technology got us to where it's 80 times 80 times more effective than it was when you first tried out the idea. Yeah, efficient or faster or cheaper. Yeah. Um, but it's not an inflection point where the use case becomes common enough that it's the new standard. Yeah, which is, which is cool. And I think often, like, we, it's easy to sort of, like, laugh out or dismiss, like, the early attempts, you know, because they don't go super well when it's brand new. But then that's what's built on, uh, built upon, you know, over time. Uh, and without that, like, you don't have the 80x improvement in eight years. Yeah. That's not done the first time. So, Kudos to you for keeping on that idea, you know, for, mm -hmm. for being the person who's just crazy enough to try it. Yeah. You, know, you were, you, you know, our boy Cyrus was like the first one. He's like, I think we can do this. I'm going to try really hard to make it happen. Obviously, he had no idea what that would become you know, a hundred years down the road, 200 years. But he probably had a vision, right? Yeah. Which is like the cool part, I think, is that, I mean, just to tie it back to even, you know, any any company or our company, like the vision is important because that's what guides and what drives those efforts, right? I'm sure you had that vision of like, hey, this is what I think this can be. Maybe not like today, maybe not even in my lifetime, but this is like the start. I see it. Yeah. And that's probably what drove them to, you know, keep going after four failed attempts of laying that cable and coming back with egg on his face every time, you know, like, and I think that's admirable. Like, but I bet that every time there was like, there was something that he learned, there was something that he iterated on and he said, okay, yep. that if this goes a little bit better than the last time I tried, will that, you know, yep. is incremental improvement enough for me to keep iterating on this idea until I get it? And even if people thought he was crazy, you know. Which, by the way, I read that there were. It was interesting uh, that when it broke within three weeks, apparently there were like a rash of stories by like calling it a hoax. <laughs> it was just made up. It was like publicity. Uh, it never existed. And I was just like, that's so interesting, right? That that's like, you know, the a, a narrative around that. That was the conspiracy theory of the era. Yeah. Yeah, that but was, oh, I just that never was even moon knew it was landing. real. <laughs> yep. 
yeah, I just thought, you know, some things never change, I guess. But it's, I think it's also, you know, like, I mean, maybe they're a little bit in the right to think like that it has to be a joke because you can't, maybe you can't, you don't have the vision for what that could have been or what it is. You know, like you, if, if somebody doesn't have the ability to grasp um, what an undertaking that is. Maybe they're more predisposed to think that it wasn't true in the first place because they're just like, we're never going to talk to them again. We're never going to talk to Great Britain. We don't need them. But it, it speaks to the power of vision. You know, like I think that in a business context is sometimes like overlooked or can be overlooked as not, you know, as like a not sort of a nice to have in an organization or a structure. And obviously like vision itself doesn't produce results, but I think it's a necessary like foundation for that. Um, because it creates people who go after stuff like this, you know, right? Not easily persuaded. Yep. Otherwise, it creates people who who follow their crazy ideas and why yeah. they're doing something yeah. that changes humanity. I mean, I feel like that's a really big word to put to this, but it's also you know like being crazy enough to have yep. this idea is what has ultimately enabled this like globally connected world that we live in right now. And it takes those people who have those big ideas to try them and fail and try again. Yeah. I mean, like even thinking about that today feels like a crazy idea. If you're going to lay cable across the Atlantic ocean, like, okay, have fun. Yeah. But even in like, <laughs> but imagine that in 18, you know, 60 or 1850, like, yeah, that must've just seemed laughable, you know? Yeah. Like, why don't you just go throw my money into the ocean? You know, but they got it done. He's like, really I cool. will four times. <laughs> the fifth time your but money will be time. worth it. <laughs> for three weeks. Until three it weeks. But, uh, Long enough for the president and the queen to say hi. I feel like this is a weird question, but like, what's your favorite thing about globalization or like being globally connected? I think it's it's allowed perspective in a lot of ways, right? That people just would never otherwise have. Um, and that perspective is like so hard to get because everybody has their own, you know, lived experience and that's real. But I think the fact that it's really easy or much easier to now go, hey, like, let me look at what life is like somewhere else in, in the world, uh, understand cultures how people perceive things like makes that it just allows people to go oh interesting i would have never thought about that that way or i would have never known that somebody like lived this way or so i think that part's cool is it allows for for perspective change um on a less deep note like i think it's cool that you can have like sports teams and fandoms out of like earthwide you know yeah uh like soccer like you'll have people all over the world cheering for a club somewhere uh which is like, just cool like it's a sports game. fan and yeah we we're sitting yeah at, yeah at the beer bar last night next to a couple from philly and the guy had an arsenal arsenal fan case yeah like yeah 100 percent. yeah i think that that's cool it's like it enables stuff like that like communities that can share i don't know common interests now you know globally yeah because uh, it's just all right there at our fingers which is crazy but i think that's a positive part of it. You totally. know, to sure. be able to just kind of think like we have, there is a global community. It's, there is much more out there than just what you see. Yeah. Especially, you know, when we think about like what's on the news, um, there are always people in the places where you're watching the news who do have a very different lived experience than what we see. And just kind of open yourself up to that and get perspective and learn really cool yeah 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 definitely but it comes with its you know negatives too right where it's easy to get overwhelmed by the negatives that you hear about uh, because you can find it everywhere at, at every second right like you can find some new article if you wanted about something terrible happening and so you know i think it's just learning as like people how to process that and and not be overwhelmed but you know to find the good parts of it the eternal existential crisis of living in a small dot on the globe. Thanks for joining me today, Tyler. This has been super fun. Yeah, what a cool topic. I'm stoked about it. 
Uh, I'm I'm sorry I only had one, or maybe people are grateful I only had one bad dad joke. But uh, next time I'll I'll try. We'll see what we can do. Do better. Thanks for listening to the Frontier Podcast powered by Gun.io. We drop two episodes per week, so if you like this episode. Be sure to subscribe on your platform of choice and come hang out with us again next week and bring all your internet friends. If you have questions or recommendations, just shoot us a Twitter DM at the Frontier Pod and we'll see you next week.